All right. Hello, everybody out there. Tom Dimitrovich here, and welcome to another IAEI News Live. Today's discussion is on marinas and marina safety. Just want to make sure I was, I was actually live. All right, so today's discussion is marinas and marina safety. We're going to talk about marinas in the 2022, what's coming in in 2023, where we've come and how far we've come. Niha Adel Sharif, thanks for being here, brother. And remember, today's discussion, marinas, marina safety in 2022, raising awareness. And it all starts now. Right. Well, what a topic we have today. Marinas. Um, I can't tell you how important this discussion is to me. I think um, if there's any place that I think that our electrical industry has made a movement in the needle, Larry Griffith, thank, for jo thank you for joining. If there's any place where Marinas has made a huge improvement in safety, I think Marinas is a great example. Hey, Michael Hofkin, we had a great Independence Day. We had a great day. We had a, in fact, I took all last week off. Um, Michael, I had uh, Bobby Joe and I, we just uh, took a break. We got a lot of things done around the house. Um, didn't go anywhere. We just, we were, what do they call that? A staycation? Stay, staycation? We had a staycation. So, and, and, um, Marina's is, uh, this discussion today, I think, is really important because we're in the middle of summer. And unfortunately, every summer, we lose people, I'll say, kids. So uh, unfortunately, that's what we, um, that's what we, that's what we lose. Um, and we lose them, unfortunately, to, in many cases, electric shock drowning, um, electrocutions, and always oh, show ribbon. I just have to do something here. So I, I was sitting here and I had my finger on the on the uh, return key, and I um, I made a boo boo file close. I'm going to close this. I'm not going to save it. I don't know what I'm losing, but I'm losing Marina safety. Here we go. This looks a little bit better. All right. Full screen mode. Okay, so, uh, hey, we got David Engelhart, Florida, buddy. This is right up your alley. Hopefully, you will uh, join in. And Don Ganier, thanks for joining. Uh, we are going to talk about marinas and marina safety today. So, whoa, wrong one. I got to put the um, PowerPoint up. There we go. Is that better? Better for me. Okay, so we're going to hit marinas. We're going to talk about safety in marinas, um, the statistics. We're going to take a look at some statistics, and I want to show you some things that have changed, um, even outside of codes and standards. You know, a lot of what we do, and I just had this, I had this discussion with someone else today. We talked about the, you know, changing uh, national electrical code, electrical standards, and things of that nature. Michael. You, you know, you, you're probably familiar with this. You know the process. Most people who are watching this, uh, back to Worth Tuesday, most people watching this understand codes and standards uh, seeks to increase safety through um, either requirements on how we test products or requirements on installation and maintenance. Uh, we, we talk about safe work practices and all that jazz. But safety 
especially in these applications, goes beyond the electrical industry. And I want to share with you what my perspective is and what I'm seeing on how we've changed not just the electrical industry, but awareness in general. Okay. So marinas and marina safety has a new discuss. There's new um, materials and discussions that are being shared with the general public. More so today around preventing electrical shock, electrical shock drownings than ever before. And we can say we're changing electrical standards and we are changing requirements, but we're also changing a culture. And that culture change is more difficult than modifying the National Electrical Code. And, and, and making changes in this book <laughs> can be very difficult. But changing and influencing change in behaviors of individuals outside of our industry is even more difficult. But we are making a difference. And, and, and I'm going to show you some of that, uh, which is why I, uh, how I, I made this mistake um, uh, earlier. But, um, uh, and I'm going to give you some examples. Here, here's, here's just some examples. This, I'm going out to uh, just general web pages, right? Websites and doing searches. This is the Tennessee Department of Commerce and Insurance. Uh, avoiding the risks of electric shock drowning when spending time on the water this summer. This is from 2021, Wednesday, 2021. And look, it's in July. So July, you know, we come off of Electrical Safety Month in May. We're moving into June. Things are, the water is warming up. You know, uh, it, it takes some time for the water to get to that temperature where it's fun to swim in. July and, and August to prime, you know, uh, months for if you're living in Pennsylvania or in those states where it gets cold, right? Uh, this is not, you know, I'm not talking, David, I'm not talking Florida, uh, where swimming is year round, basically. And I used to live in St. Petersburg, all that jazz. But, um, but in, in, in these freshwater applications, and we're going to talk a little bit about freshwater versus salt water and what we've learned there. But, but what, what, I'm, what I'm looking at here is this is Tennessee Commerce. This is, um, well, you know, again, uh, reminding us of the deaths in and around uh, marinas. This is uh, Antioch man found dead from drowning near Antioch Marina identified um, Danville resident. And this is Memorial Day, June 3rd. This is this year. This is this year. I'm not saying it's electric shock. I'm just showing you that marinas and in, the, in and around waters, when we're fishing, swimming, any type of boating is dangerous on a lot of different fronts. Uh, here's another one. Authorities confirm Prairie Creek drowning victims' identity, not necessarily uh, addressed uh, by, not, not, not caused necessarily by electrocution, um, but again, just another example of, um, of deaths in and around a man pulled from the Susquehanna River near Goldsboro. This was May, May 31st, updated May 31st, 2022. So there are, there are, Various examples of where we um, are still feeling the pain of, of losing people in and around marinas and bodies of water, whether it's due to electrical or not. Uh, but we're all aware, you know, trying to raise the awareness of uh, electric shock and electric shock drownings. So there are many different resources. If you sat down and, and did some searches state by state, You'd find state of Michigan's doing a lot for educating around uh, marina safety. Tennessee educating around marina, marina safety. Pennsylvania, a lot of states are educating, and that's how we change a culture. We raise the awareness of what the problem is. You offer some solutions, whether it is uh, product related, operating and procedures related, installation requirements related education, just general education and awareness related, and then we got to get the word out. Organizations like the Electrical Safety Foundation International, ESFI, ESFI.org, 
uh, puts together a lot of materials around electrical safety. Let me find my, um, I'll give you an example of this. Um, here, here's, a, here's an example. I think this is this is right. Yep, there we go. Uh, Michigan Marine Safety Program Assessment. This was uh, this is a document that that uh, highlights uh, from a Michigan perspective, boating, uh, and and again, look look what this is saying. Boating is critical to Michigan's quality of life and economy. Think about Mich the state of Michigan. How many lakes? Uh, you got the Great Lakes all around it. That's all freshwater. Um, uh, 18.4 million boating days and spent $635 million on boating trips in Michigan. So people are traveling, they're enjoying the water, and what we want to do as part of the electrical industry is make sure that it's safe for them from an electrical perspective. Can't help you if you can't swim. I can't help you if you fall overboard because you were drinking too much. Uh, I can't help you on a lot of those things, but I, the electrical industry can help you to make sure you don't get electrocuted on a dock or a pier. Um, what else? They put these, uh, these are stickers that are put out. This is from Michigan. They're putting water, look at this, warning, do not enter water, electric shock hazard. Now, there was a code change that was, that was um, a part of, and I don't have my other spectacles. I've got to get my emergency spectacles. There was a code change made as part of 555. I believe it was in the 2017. If you look at, there's a requirement for signage. And um, I think it was more towards 555. There's floating buildings. There's your equipment grounding. Disconnecting means leakage current. Temporary wiring, outdoor portable cables, replacements, other than shore power. There is signage requirements in here. I know it. I'm looking for it. Shore fire receptacles, boat with signage, 555.10. I started from the back and worked my way to front. So 555.10 says permanent safety signs shall be installed to give notice of electrical shock hazard risk to persons using or swimming near a docking facility, boat yard, or marina and shall comply with all of the following. Signs shall comply with 110.21b1 and be of a sufficient durability. Signs shall be clearly visible and the sign shall be state warning, potential shock hazard. And it says the sign shall state warning, potential shock hazard, electrical currents may be present in the water. Now this doesn't comply with that. Um, let's take a look at some other posters. Do not enter electrical shock hazard. Electrical currents may be present. So here's an example of a, uh, a sign that um, would meet 555.10 requirements in signage and, prov and provides all of the information uh, that is, uh, that is uh, required. My technicians are working on a marina right now in Cape Canaveral, Florida. There we go. Excellent. Thank God for earbuds. Excellent. Good to hear from you. Uh, Don Kinnear, at least that sign is compliant with the ANSI rules for warning signs. Unlike the language specified in the NEC, well, it was, Don, but then we changed it. We influenced the change. Uh, here's, a, here's another one. This is, uh, let's see, let's take a look. Hidden dangers, look at this. This is from Michigan Boating. I mean, th look at this. Think about this. This is Michigan Boating. And... Hidden dangers in the water, electric shock drowning can be deadly. Uh, how boat inspections can help. Remember, it's not just about the infrastructure on the pier. It could very well be because of what's on the boat itself. In fact, it's probably more likely that there's a problem on the boat that's getting into the water than, uh, than some of the um, things that we see uh, on, on piers and whatnot. But again, it depends on a lot of factors, and I'll show you some pictures of what I'm talking about. So um, power cords are good condition. The ways to prevent electrical shock, drowning, turning off shore power, if you feel tingling sensations. This is, this is, I can't, I can't, I can't describe how important it is that the work that you're doing, when you see 
organizations like Michigan.gov voting. This isn't ESFI. This isn't Electrical Safety Foundation International. This isn't NFPA. This isn't any a single manufacturer. This is much bigger. We're influencing the edu- and educating more than just the electrical industry. We're reaching outside of the electrical industry. And that is a critical piece of this puzzle. So these are, exa- these are just examples. This is ESFI. ESFI puts materials together that are free downloads off of their website that you can download and educate. If you own a boat, if you belong to a, a club, you know, educate, put some of their information around and, and help share uh, information so that people understand this hazard, this thing we call shock, and that it can exist in these areas. There's a marina safety checklist that ESFI put together. That, and this is a nice little trifold pamphlet that you can download and you can share uh, in your uh, in, in applications. Best man, Look at this. This is Best Management Practices for Marina Electrical Safety put out from the Association of Marina Industries. And you just look at the uh, basic electrical theory. I mean, think about this. We're teaching people who aren't electrical professionals information to help them understand the hazards in around marinas because the hazards are definitely real. Marinas present a clash of electricity and water, and we have to understand what that means. Now, electric shock drowning. I've used that term a few times. What is electrical shock drowning? Basically, in a nutshell, we understand in the electrical industry that current through the body, current through a human body has effect, depending upon how much current and how much time, right? So what happens with electric shock drownings is a swimmer, a swimmer, who swims into an electrical field that's in the water. Now, you've got to understand that when you have a problem, and I, and I have a picture of a boat in the center of this one, but when there is a, when there is a problem, say on the boat there's a wiring issue and you have current, and you, and you might say, well, I have a fiberglass boat, I can't get electric current into the water. If I have a fault inside my boat, believe me, it'll find its way into the water a couple different ways. One might be a metal ladder that's over the edge, and you might say, well, I have all plastic ladders. Well, good for you. But how about that motor rudder that's in the back of that engine? That is bolted to the frame of that structure. If that becomes energized, you can introduce electrical currents into the water through the propeller that pushes that boat around. And and I I have a good feeling that that's probably metal. So in any case, or or very conductive. In any case, you you have a source of current and ingredients that are away from that source of current. As you get closer to the source of current, you are further and further into the field of current that's flowing through the water and more current will go through your body. So the challenge for a swimmer as they're swimming, say that boat, I have the picture of a boat, but it very well could be a structure in a pier. If I have a, a structure that's energized, say for example, because of a, f- a problem like this, where water entered the uh, receptacle outlet and energized the infrastructure of, uh, of the pier. Now, I am, instead of that boat being there, now I have a pier that is energized and emitting currents that are finding its way back to the source through the water. As the swimmer enters this zone, and, and you're going to remember your, your, um, you're probably worse off if you're laying down in your vertical 
going into this as, as opposed to being standing straight up and down or uh, I guess floating straight up and down because now the gradients, the difference between the front of your body and the back of your body is a shorter distance, right? But in any case, um, as you move into this field, your current starts to pass through your body. And the more current that passes through your body, the higher the amplitude of current, the different types of effects that it will have on, uh, on your muscles and your sensations. And I believe I have a, I believe I have a table in here somewhere. I thought I did. I may not, actually. But there are different levels, and we understand that you have the tingling sensation, you have, um, as current increases, your muscles will start to contract. And you, if you think about a swimmer, you're in a body of water. When you can no longer kick your legs or move your arms to keep yourself afloat, you can sink. Hence, when you, when you sink into the water and you can't move your limbs to get above water, you drown. There's no physical um, evidence of when a person experiences electrical shock drowning. Now. That's if you actually experience a drowning. In the case of, a, for example, Lucas Ritz, Lucas, uh, Lucas was swimming in a marina, and Lucas was in a marina. Let me just grab another photo here. If you don't know Lucas's story, I'll try to see if I can put uh, a link. But Luke, Lucas was, um, was basically swimming in a... Um, and say this air, like, like say Lucas and his brothers would, would uh, go up to the end of the pier and, and because of the way the currents were flowing, would float down and get off and then they would just keep going in a circle and keep doing it over and over and over. Well, Lucas decided that he wanted to come in. He didn't want to swim anymore. And as Lucas, now he had a life preserver on. So Lucas's death in a marina was not a drowning. His was truly an electrocution. Because what happened to Lucas was, as he moved closer to the pier, he felt current. He felt the tingling sensation. He felt the pulsing. He probably, now Lucas was very young, he probably swam and moved in closer thinking that that pier was safety where in fact because the problem was actually a docked boat who had a wiring problem as lucas swam it got closer and closer to the source more current went through his body he let out a gasp and he lost his life due to current and defibrillation all that jazz lucas didn't drown so you can be electrocuted in the water, not touching anything physical other than being in the water because current is, is flowing through that body of water back to the source. Now, a discussion always arises on whether or not you have a problem in salt water or if you have, if the problem doesn't exist in fresh water. And the, to understand why there's a difference there. You have to understand conductivity. Remember, conductivity is one over the resistance. So it's the inverse of resistivity, and they call that conductivity. So conductivity is one over the resistance, and they call them Mohs, you know, Mohs nose. And if you look at the conductivity of freshwater, versus the conductivity of salt water. They do differ. When it comes to salt water, or any time you add material, uh, I'll call them impurities, or whatever you want to call them, to water, you are um, decreasing the conductivity, or increasing the conductivity. 
which is decreasing the resistance. Because remember, as conductivity goes up, resistivity is going down because resistance is the, in the denominator, not the numerator. It's one over resistance. So smaller values of resistance give you larger values of conductivity. Fresh water streams have large values of conductivity. What does that mean? That means the resistance of the water is larger than, say, um, potable water, melted snow, distilled water. Seawater can be upwards of 55,000 micromoles per centimeter. 55,000. Why is, what does that mean? If the conductivity is much higher, the resistance is much lower. And that's because of the impurities that are in the water. Now, how does, what does that have to do with electric shock through the body? Imagine, and we know the resistance values. We've done 70E training, safe work practices to understand the impedance of a human body. The impedance of the human body doesn't change when you get in water. I mean, your skin being wet does change, but wet skin, that number, those numbers of resistance, it doesn't matter if I'm in water, if I'm not in water, if I'm wet, I'm wet. My resistivity of my skin, my body, from toe to head, from shoulder to shoulder, all that jazz stays the same. So when I'm in a body of water, if the impedance around me, if the impedance around me is very low, I'll still get current passing through my body. Remember, Don, current takes all paths, right? So even though I am a higher resistance, some current will still flow through my body. But if, if the resistance around me is much less, I'll have less current going through my body and more current going through the um, through around me. You can look at it as like a parallel circuit, right? You can look at, at conductors or resistances in parallel and you're in parallel with the water. And so if the if the water around you is very low resistance, you'll get less current flowing through you than you will if the water around you is high resistance. That's why in fresh water, They'll say, I have, I've heard people say that fresh water is a higher hazard because more current will pass through the human body because the resistance of the water around you is high. Not that current doesn't still go through that water. It's just now you are the lower impedance in the picture. So more current goes through you than through around you, around you in that fresh water. So now, there are IEEE papers. There was an IEEE paper uh, uh, perf conducted for the, an, in the electrical safety workshop. And uh, I was looking, oh, I just closed it. Um, IEEE electrical, electrical sh shock drowning. Examining the risks. There we go. I triple E I got to go out to explore again. Okay, this was the title of the. Um, here's the title of the web page, or I'm sorry, the web page, the uh, paper that was that was provided. Uh, that was it was actually during I think it was the 2020. Um, no, it was like 2018 or so. Uh, electrical I triple E electrical safety workshop. So this was July, August. This was in IEEE transactions. So if it was published in IEEE transactions in 2020, this was either presented at the 2019 or 2018 IEEE electrical safety workshop. But what this, what these engineers did was they took a look at specifically salt water as opposed and compared that with fresh water to say, is the hazard still there or isn't it and what their conclusion was their conclusion was that the hazard is extended further in saltwater applications because of the lower impedance the currents have a larger 
um, a larger circle of in influence. Remember our remember our circle of influence. Um, our circle of influence, right? If the extent of current, how far it flows out into the body of water is dependent upon the impedance of the water itself, their argument in this paper was that they measured currents further away from the source than in salt water than in fresh water. So the current can have a further reach out into the body of water because the impedance of the body of water in salt water is less. That makes sense, right? Now, the, the, the challenge that I have is I can't find electric shock drowning examples in salt water applications. I've, I've looked, I, I cannot find them. Um, I've seen, I've actually seen data points that say uh, numbers, number of electrocutions or whatever, uh, electric shock drownings, and they do give you saltwater numbers, but I can't find the examples that they used. So I think the, the, you can't say that the problem doesn't exist in saltwater, but you can say um, that. At least I know I can say I can't find examples of saltwater applications where people are electrocuted. Um, that's me. That doesn't mean someone out there can't say that, uh, well, look, here are, here's the evidence. I'd love to see that evidence. Marina Tuesday. Absolutely. All right. So I got to look at some of these. Uh, there's a lot of chatting going on, and I really appreciate the chatting. I do want to remind everybody to subscribe don't forget to subscribe to the IAEI's YouTube channel, please. Uh, hit, that, hit that subscribe button. If you're watching this on LinkedIn, which I see some comments coming in on LinkedIn, uh, please get over there to the IAEI's YouTube channel and subscribe to it so you don't miss a session. All right, so let's, wow, we got some good dialogue. Tommy D, back to work Tuesday. Good afternoon. Coincidentally, okay, we already read that. Good morning, Don Ganeer. Robert from Omaha, at least that sign is compliant. We saw that ANSI standard requires that a warning sign give directions as to how to avoid the hazard. Interesting, Don. Interesting. The language specified in the NEC does not provide that direction. Is that right? Are you sure? Are you sure about that? Ten seconds. Hold on, Don. I thought that 555.10. Said something. Signage. It says uh, warning: potential shock hazard. Electric currents may be present in the water. Yeah, it doesn't say do not swim. You're right. No swimming. That's a good point. It should tell you what to do, and it doesn't. Very good point. And you know what? I look forward to your public input. And don't say you already did and they rejected it. The wording of the hazard and the direction of what to do, such as do not swim. There you go, Robert. Thank you. Plaintiff's attorney would likely get a summary judgment against the marine owner after a shock incident if the only language on the sign was that specified in the NEC. Ooh. I, I, you know what, Dawn? Uh, make, I mean, let's take a look at, um, I'm going to take a look at TerraView, and we're going to look at what, uh, if any changes were made on signage. No, it does. Uh, so permanent safety signs shall be installed, and it still says warning, potential shock hazard, electrical currents may be present in the water. There were no changes made during the 2023 cycle. And I'm going to take a look, Dawn, and see if you made any public inputs. I'm going to look at the first draft print report and see if there were any suggested changes in that line. 555, marinas, 555.10, signage. Hey, let's see if there are any public inputs. There were no public inputs to 555.10, no public comments to 555.10. And if it's a problem, Dawn, you gotta, you gotta, anybody out there, I encourage you to put public inputs and public comments in to say, maybe simply adding, do not swim or do not enter water. Because remember, 
Um, if I'm working on my boat, I may want to get in the water. It may say, do not get in the water instead of don't swim, because I could argue, well, I wasn't swimming. Direction on how to turn off the power is not good enough. All right. Uh, Robert, how about plaque showing the location of the overcurrent protective device? Ooh, I'll tell you. Okay. Now, the, over, the location of the overcurrent protective device, I guess Robert from Omaha. Um, one of the changes that they are looking at for the 2023 cycle, and I'm not sure if I agree with it or not, but I will put it out there. I understand the concept. I'm not sure if I like the where they ended up on the language. Um, let's see. It says replacement of equipment. No, marina's boat, electrical equipment connections. What I'm looking for is they have a requirement now for a emergency disconnect. There it is. 555.36, and I believe 555.36 is new. Let me just double check. 555.36, yes, C. 555.36, C. Okay, you ready for this one? 555.36C, emergency electrical disconnect. Each marina power outlet or enclosure that provides shore power to boats shall be provided with a listed emergency shutoff device or electrical disconnect that is clearly marked emergency shutoff in accordance with 110.22A. The emergency shutoff device or electrical disconnect shall be within sight of the marina power outlet or other enclosure that provides shore power to boats readily accessible, externally operable, manually resettable, and listed for use in wet locations. So hold on. Let's just think about. I just want to um, so so here I, I, I've got a, a little bit of an issue I think I think I do I think I can I think I can let's break this down this is a this is a new requirement All right I'm just gonna I, and this is the way I, I I analyze things and I right wrong or indifferent it's just what I do. All right, so let's do this. I have these things labeled wrong. PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, so let's um, make this a little larger. Each marina power outlet or enclosure that provides shore power to a boat shall be provided with a listed emergency. Uh, shall be provided with. Uh, not, okay, shall be provided with a listed. It doesn't tell you. It says each marina power outlet or enclosure. It, it says shall be provided with, but it doesn't tell you it needs to be on the outlet provided with. The emergency shutoff device or electrical disconnect shall be within sight of the marina power outlet or other enclosure that provides shore power to boats, readily accessible, externally operable, manually resettable, okay, so, and listed for use in wet locations. All right, so let's move this out. Okay, so the first one tells us each marina power outlet or enclosure that provides shore power to boats, each of them. So if I looked at, for example, I probably have a picture of a boat here somewhere. Marina. Each of them has to be provided with an emergency shutoff. Can't find one very easily. 
Gosh darn it. Um, each of them. So the emergency shutoff device or electrical disconnect shall be within sight of the power outlet. So that means I could put something. So here's my question. Can one button, can one disconnect serve multiple power outlets? So for example, uh, to your point, Robert, and you say a plaque showing the locations of overcurrent protective devices, if I had multiple buttons that can be accessed, that are within sight of the marina power outlet or whatever enclosures that provides shore power to boats, and let's say that I shut power down to the pier in an emergency. It's like a gas station. You've seen those mushroom where you hit it and you can kill power to the, um, to the canopy and everything that's out there. It has to de-energize the power supply to all circuits supplied by the marina power outlets or enclosures that provide shore power to boats. A circuit breaker handle shall not be used for this purpose. So they want another, an external button. And technically, and this was the argument that I had, I said, and I think how this started, I suggested in, in, in many discussions because, um, and, and I'll tell you one case that brought this up for me. There was an, uh, an example of an individual, a dog fell into the water. Pet, the family pet fell into the water. A child jumped in to save the dog. There was electric current going in the water at that point. The child jumps in to save the dog and begins to struggle. The father jumps in to chase, save the child and begins to struggle. I think another person jumped in to save them and began to struggle. The mother was going to jump in when somebody yelled, kill power to the boat and they shut the power off. Now, when I read that story, when I read that example, not only one, the, the youngest child uh, died, unfortunately. Uh, everybody else survived. In that example, if there was an emergency shutoff that was readily accessible, not to kill power to the, to, to the one boat, because you got to think about it. It it you if 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 the, the the way the language needs in my opinion needs to read is you want to kill power to that entire pier. If there's an emergency and somebody is getting electrocuted, somebody is is uh, is is feeling the ill effects of electricity in the water. You don't know where it's coming from. It could you're not going to walk around to every single marina power outlet and kill power until until you find the one that was providing the energy, you want to go to one spot and you want to kill power to that pier. That's my opinion. Um, this is, I think, a start to that journey. Is it perfect? Is 555.36C, the new language in the 2023 code cycle, perfect? I don't know that it's perfect, but I think that it gives us something to throw darts at. You people that are working out there on marinas, look at that marina. Say, can you put some control wiring in to shunt trip and kill power? Maybe you kill power to the feeder that's coming out to the pier itself. And you shut power down to the entire pier when there's an emergency. And then you educate everybody and you put multiple buttons that are, what? Readily accessible, externally operable, manually resettable, and listed for use in wet locations. and they should all be within sight of the marina power outlets, all of them, or other enclosures that provide short power to boats. If somebody's getting hurt, if there's, a, if there's an inclination that there's current in the water, you should be able to shut power off to the entire pier and not create a whack-a-mole example of which pedestal do I need to turn off because it might be too late. 
All right, Robert Fomomo. Willie Snyder, will you wouldn't believe how many service calls he gets resetting a GFCIs and the equipment has problems. It did its job and they don't know how to reset it. That's true. You know, good point, Willie. But you know what that is? That is your opportunity to investigate and educate the owner and possibly secure a service agreement where you can go out and perform maintenance on those marinas. Any sign is showing how to shut off the power is only telling you how to eliminate the hazard after the fact. It must tell you how to completely avoid the hazard. Stay out of the water. I agree with you, Don. And don't touch anything metal on the pier. Because it's not just in the water, too. I mean, if you energize the pier, you could touch a metal post and bam. No swimming. Warning. Potential shock hazard. Earth electric. Electric currents may be present in the water. These currents, everybody's trying to come up with right words for their next public input. And you know what I'm going to do? I am going to go to my notebook. I'm going to my notebook. Okay, I'm going to my, I'm going to my notebook. And uh, this is what you do. When you have ideas like this, and I know, Dawn, you probably have these I, uh, already. You go to your notebook and you cr uh, go to what I have is a, I have a 2026 folder for 70. NFPA 2026, and I have uh, suggested, I go to right, and we're going to go to, which is this 555.10, right? So 555.10, 555.10 signage, 555.10, and uh, the, the, the issue is, I believe you, ANSI requires, ANSI requires uh, more. I'll just put that, 555.10, and we'll come up with that language. And maybe we'll do it live. You never know. No swimming, no swimming. That's language not good enough. Must say, boy, you guys are going back and forth. It would seem if the installation was compliant, the signage wouldn't be required. <laughs> oh, David Engward. And then David just comes in with the mic drop. All right. <laughs> I love it, David. If it's compliant, you don't need the signs because we have made a safe installation. Do not enter the water. I'm going to have to search online for or get it custom made. Great advice. Thanks, Don. Um, David, I can't imagine an electrical installation that could not fail in a manner that creates a hazard. And then Don Ganeer says, mic drop. You're right. Even though you have an impeccable installation, here's the challenge with, this is the challenge with regard to um, these installations. They age, right? They get Dirt daubers. I learned what dirt daubers is in Pennsylvania. Uh, the, the solutions get out of date. This is no longer even permitted. And look at the way the wires pass down through the water. You get uh, modifications uh, that occur throughout the life of the installation. Things are replaced and or taken or removed and not the holes aren't plugged. Okay. There are so many examples of problems in and around marinas because of the aging infrastructure. You look at the equipment that fails over its life, that doesn't get, that, that wires that go into the water and they're getting rubbed the, and, 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 uh, and uh, the insulation removed, ener energizing the water around it. You get, um, a lot of the, I call it the MacGyver nature, right? You get uh, these types of scenarios where, look at this. This is a, this is a standard receptacle. A standard receptacle, GFCI. Hey, it's GFCI. But GFCI receptacles are supposed to be in an enclosure. And, and we, have, we have rules and laws around that that aren't followed, unfortunately. Terminations, deterioration to, um, to equipment. Apply, you know, all the different, uh, there's just so many examples of an aging infrastructure. This, this, these 
chords are not listed for the application. Look at this. This this is a chord somebody just needed to get power from point A to point B, and this chord is not listed for that application. You get homemade examples of of, uh, of 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 solutions that are put in place because there's a need, and where there's a need there and 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 a desire, there is a way. And unfortunately, those who do things like this aren't aware of the proper way to con to to do installations. There are reasons why we need electricians out there and we need qualified individuals. These are all examples of how the aging of the infrastructure and the nature of the get it done nature of your standard boaters out there who aren't, uh, I would say, your most electrically proficient individuals, they'll do what they need to do to get the job done. And there are documents out there like NFPA 303 that uh, help us understand uh, what you need to do for fire protection and, and continued maintenance. 70B is another good document that we need to be aware of to help us understand the maintenance and work that we need to do. Um, 555, the NEC, Article 555, continuously changing. So, uh, so we got Joseph Viola, John Ganeer had rejected PIs on, on that at least twice, and the panel has rejected them. Not sure which one you're talking to, Don. David Smith, he liked it and he subscribed. You are the man, David A. Getting it done. Uh, Earth Electric, there's a company that cleans barnacles off of the boats at a particular marina. It's very concerning considering all the electrical work we've done here and we have a lot of signs. Ah, there, there's an example. Sometimes you got to get into the water. You've got to get into the water. Um, and Nihad says, I believe ESD is not an issue in salt water because the salt makes the water resistant resistance much lower than the human body resistance. Thus, the majority of the current will... And, and, and uh, I've seen that. Um, I, I agree with you, Nihad. I, I somewhat agree with you. I wouldn't go out on the limb to say it's not a problem. Um, I can't effectively say we don't have evidence of a problem. Yeah, um, not that it doesn't exist. My public input specific to the ANSI requirements after being rejected more than once. <sighs> Man, Don, I'm going to go back. I'm going to find your language, and we're going to try to make it happen, brother. Salt water is not as problematic as fresh water. I would agree with that. The reason is salt water. I agree with you. Um, the public input number, there you go, 1891, 2017 code. Public input, 1891. So I come in here and I say PI 1891 70-2017. Uh, I will look for that, Don. Renee Graves, installing an emergency off button would remove the hazard and allow for rescue to occur. Exactly. Exactly, Renee. And that's what it's all about. And then you have to have to train people to know when to hit that button because What's that? Uh, what was the name of that um, crying wolf? What was that? It kept crying wolf, and then nobody believed him, right? Um, so you don't want to misuse that. Local HJ should implement an inspection process that could be carried out by the local inspectors of fire departments. Yes. Oh, and, and that's a part of NFPA 303. That's the other thing, Renee, is there are requirements that marinas be inspected and continuously inspected every so many every year annually, and there's things that you need to do. NFP 70B talks about maintenance, and that's another, it's, it's moving to a requirement, but 303, NFPA 303 is a very important document that a lot of people forget about. Um, and I know a few individuals that, that, that do inspect marinas after the fact in accordance with NFPA 303. All right, it's going down through. I love the dialogue. Uh, there are 30 PIs on my 2026, 1256. The stray current 
may be from an adjacent system with a deteriorating neutral with an emergency shutoff for the entire pier. Yes, Brian Rock's in the house. Excellent. Neha, there may be a shock in salt water. He's still on that salt water kick. Yep, and I, and I agree with you. The hazard can also be caused by the boat itself and not from the fix. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're right, Don. And here's the thing. The boat, now when you kill power to the boat, that emergency disconnect will kill power to the boat. The engine's not running, why? Because they're getting power from shore. When you kill power onto that marina, to that pier, you're gonna kill power to the boat and then the source of the problem goes away even if it's on the boat. Uh, 680.4 rule, periodic inspection and testing would be a great addition to Article 555. Great point, Keith, great point. Uh, Tim, why was 30 milliamps chosen? Oh, man. Okay, 30 milliamps. Um, 30 milliamps is a result of, I'm going to give you this one, uh, 30 milliamps. Let's do this. All right, there's a few research. This is another thing that we've done with the, all of the stuff that's happened on uh, in regard to marinas and marina safety. That influenced research. So there was a marina research reduction, control F. Let me just do a control F and search for 30. I know 30 is probably 303. There it is. ESD has a current strength in relationship to body mass and conduct. An electrical current of 30 milliamps is a reasonable threshold for pre precipit precipitating ESD. Oh, and um, the American Boat and Yacht Club, ABYC. ABYC. Let me find that reference. American Boat and Yacht Club. I think that was the one I closed. A, B, Y, C. There is a, um, the American Boat and Yacht Club has standards that require boats to implore. If, they, don't, they don't require, they're elective. So an A, B, Y, C, E11 covers, uh, E11 covers the um, A, B, Y, C standards. Let me just call this one up. Here we go. Okay, so here's the ABYC, and they have a list of standards. And if you look at E11, where is it? List of standards. There's A's, C's, E11, AC and DC electrical systems on boats. So they'll tell you that they, they apply to uh, votes of 50, 60 hertz, up to 300 volts. Um, all that jazz, but they have a, uh, in E11, uh, in E11, there is an 11.11.1, bunch of ones. They have 30 milliamp requirements for the main inside of a boat. And the shore power, and the, even though the research backs up the 30 milliamps, but it aligns with the boat requirements, uh, for uh, in the ABYC standards, which are not, you're not required to get a boat passed through that. It's sort of like a marketing thing where you can uh, claim your boat is better and all that jazz. Uh, but the ABYC standards uh, drove that. All right, I'm up at a hard stop. I've got a phone call I need to get on, another meeting. And I know we, we didn't go, we didn't get to everything I wanted to get to, but I love the dialogue that's going on, and I really enjoy the, this, this discussion. Please be aware, we need to be safer in our marinas. It's very important, very critical. So thank you for doing that, Dawn. Thanks for all the dialogue. Please keep up this dialogue. Share information. We're in the middle of the summer months. Let's save lives and educate each other. All right? Thanks, everybody. I do have to run uh, I got a hard stop. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Dawn. Thanks, everybody, for what you do for the electrical industry and for electrical safety. Please stay safe and remember, stay healthy.